Today we have Pat Wagner, um, who's going to be talking about online classroom success. Okay, and thank you so much. And thank you folks for joining us today. Um, I'm here in Denver, Colorado with a company called Pattern Research Inc. And I'm a big fan of Do Space. So I take it upon myself to do this little promotion for them. They don't ask me to. Do Space is a community technology library dedicated to empowering our community, Omaha and greater Omaha, through access to technology and innovative learning experiences. It pretty much is unique in the United States. There are people who do a lot of technology work within uh, public libraries, but not to the extent that do space does. So if you're from the greater Omaha area, you should be very proud and pleased to have a program like do space there as well. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've been a trainer and consultant in the library academic and related worlds for a number of years since 1978. And I had the luck to start dating a man who was uh, uh, ended up being my husband, who had actually been in the computer industry since 1963. And we got to work through our business at the time with a lot of innovators. And so this is sort of my quick history of being an online um, instructor, both face to face and also working online. And I have to say that until mm, just about 20 something years ago, I really hated it. And I really hated it for the last few years until uh, technology started to improve and until more and more people who were taking the classes were comfortable with it. And so now, particularly the last eight years, I really enjoy doing webcasts and webinars and different kinds of online instruction. I enjoy participating in it. And um, I'm very hopeful about its future, even after the pandemic. And I think there will be a time when things are different, but sort of back to normal as well. So um, I've been working at home. For those of you who are at home, I have worked out of our house since 1986. We closed down our offices for our consulting business when we realized that our cats each didn't need their own bedroom. Uh, my record being in pajamas without changing is five days and not leaving the house <laughs> except to get the mail off the front porch 11 days. So I, I have sort of an understanding of what it's like to be, uh, let's say, psychologically isolated and such. So um, and there's upsides and there are downsides as for, for whatever. So I'm coming to you not because I'm credentialed in this area, but because I have little experience and have had to figure out how to do things as well. I've also been on the road. So for the last 25 years, actually before this year, I was on the road a lot if I wasn't home, uh, have worked on the ground in all 50 states and have transversed um, your area in the Midwest, for those of you who are from the Omaha area, uh, many, many times about things. So um, I go back to the time that we were doing online education through phone lines with physical modems. And I would have to go and talk to the switchboard at the hotel or the motel and explain, yes, you're going to see that phone line open for three hours. Please don't unplug me. <laughs> so I've watched kind of the evolution of what we have. And you know what? things aren't so bad these days, really. So there's some assumptions I have about the people who might be viewing this program today. First of all, that you might be a little bit new to online learning, that you don't have necessarily decades of experience. You might have years of experience, but probably um, you really were pushed into it as a student or as an instructor in the last year, uh, that you are taking classes or giving classes that might be for credit or are required by your workplace or your school, that it isn't just the fun stuff of watching YouTube videos and kitten videos. And isn't it amazing how the world changes? My husband and I now watch kitten videos and fun animal videos at night just to lighten our day. But I'm going to pretend that for those who are doing this, it's sort of like, ah, oh, you've got deadlines and you have outcomes and you have time frames and you have resources you have to spend. And you might be worried about a grade. You might be worried about satisfying an instructor. And on the other hand, if you are an instructor, um, you have to kind of take it seriously in terms of your contract between yourself and your students as well. And you probably aren't a tech expert and you probably didn't many um, <clears throat> marry for money 
so resources are limited. <clears throat> and I have to tell you that even though my husband was a programmer and system analyst for 25 years, I kept my, what I like to call my amateur status <laughs> and made sure that I've never been a programmer or a coder and have had to work with some pretty lousy software to make it work for the sake of my online students. In fact, I'll tell you a secret, don't tell anyone, but just before we went on the air, my, my computer crashed and I had to bring it back together again. So, but I knew as, as, I, as I told your folks that no puppies were gonna die. So I didn't panic, I just kind of went through the steps. But again, I don't have 14 backup laptops you know, for this. So I'm just assuming we're all in the same boat. So what are the outcomes today? There's three outcomes. The first is that you're going to feel, I hope, more confident and competent after the program today. You'll say, okay, I'm doing pretty good. Validate you and maybe get a few tricks that will help you. That you might think about uh, improving your learning at home environment. You know, when we turned our home into our workplace and offices, there were a lot of changes we made in how we did business. And they're kind of second nature to us now. So it was really nice reflecting on what we knew and how we knew how to do it. And also something that some of us in education call the gold standard. Um, one of the theories is that for adult education in particular, um, the, the key is retention and application. So I'm also going to make the assumption that some of you are taking academic classes and things like math, but often a lot of you are either taking classes for your workplace or your school or giving classes for your workplace or your school that you have to then apply it in the real world. And so for us, the gold standard is you remember stuff well enough that you can take the information from the class and use it in some way or another. And that for me is the gold standard. And notice I didn't say test because taking a test doesn't necessarily mean that you can automatically apply it in the real world. And that's kind of what we're thinking about these days. So we have four agendas on the four items on the agenda. I'm gonna talk briefly about some key ideas. We're gonna talk about the caveats, things that are myths and things that we fall into that aren't useful. We're going to talk a little bit about the home classroom and better practices. And I'm keeping an eye on the clock, so we will have enough time at the end of the program that we will have time for questions and comments about things. So feel free during the program. Um, if you want to put something in the, in the chat box, feel free to do that and uh, be very happy to receive your questions and comments as well. So first of all, what are the key ideas when we're talking about online classroom success? And having had a business at home since 1984, we have, a, have had a lot of cat managers. So um, I was so glad when I found this image about things. So we're going to talk about the difference between new school and old school. And old school, we're talking about um, um, the analog skills that we all needed before we were doing any kind of classroom online. So new school and old, old school skills refer to digital and non-digital or, or non-virtual skills. But you know what? One is not the better than the other, and some of them are exactly the same. You know, that's one of the mythologies when a culture goes through a lot of changes, that there's this demarcation line where everything before a particular date has vanished into the ether and everything is new, or everything is new is bad and everything that's old is good. No, it's much more complicated evolution than that. And the good news is that all of you who've been involved in education as a student or an instructor already have a lot of the skill sets that work for the old and can work for the new. So what are the things that are the same when we talk about um, education and classes, right? Regardless if you're doing it online or face-to-face, -face, right? Distance learning or in person, you still have to set goals. You still have to know how to prioritize your work and what the instructor inspects, uh, expects from you. You know, I remember spending a big chunk of time when I was a face-to-face -face college instructor crafting my syllabus, which is like the contract that you have, I think, between the instructor and the students to make sure I put in 
kind of like a little reference guide, anything that I thought they should need and being very clear about what my priorities were as an instructor. At the same time, when I take classes or I'm working for clients, I because we all have too much work and we all don't have enough time or resources, have to be very good at prioritizing what I need to do next. Um, I'm not the best organized person in the world, but trust me, when I have to do this kind of work, I I could I could probably win a, a pretty high level scout badge <laughs> for how well I organize and structure things so I get them through. I have to focus and remember what the goal is. The goal today is to improve online classroom success, whether you're an instructor or you're a student. And that's what it's about. And that's what I want to make sure that my slides are about and the content are about. That there are times you have to test things. You have to test your software. You have to test your hardware. Um, you have to make sure that what you're doing is getting across to the students as well. And you have to try again, which means that you always have to leave time. Now we logged in an extra 15 minutes today and I've done a number of programs for Do Space, so I wasn't particularly concerned about getting Zoom to work, but that left me enough time to be able to reboot and get the machine working. If I had decided only to get online right before the program started, I wouldn't have that time. Recently, I ran a series of supervisory workshops for our state library here in Colorado. We had 25 participants. We had eight meetings plus tech checks and all sorts of things. Uh, the people who were taking the classes were all experienced people who worked in libraries and had experience with tech. But the interesting thing for myself and the person from the state library I worked with is about one third of the people taking what was a pretty simple class, a series of webinars and a discussion group with LinkedIn were failing, not failing the content, but failing to be able to get their technology to work. And the main problem was, is that they didn't believe they needed to have, they, they had to check stuff. They didn't um, believe that they had to um, take some time to invest. And um, they uh, blew off our tech checks completely. So, um, that whole thing of leaving time and testing and trying again is something that we all need. And when we were, uh, when it's a face-to-face -face class, it's making sure that we don't try to catch the last bus or make sure that we don't wait to the very last minute to drive, particularly if there's rush hour traffic. That we're aware of the timelines and the deadlines we have to worry about. And then that gold standard again, ret retention and application. That's the same those things are the same. Um, and I have to tell people this, and the reason I bring this up is because when I have done um, courses with people, and when we're online, or if I'm in a face-to-face -face program where everybody has a computer in front of them and they're working, every single time, someone will raise their hand or email me privately and say, is it okay, is it legal to take notes with pen and paper? Like that, like there's some federal law that if you're doing digital learning, you can't be, you know, taking notes at the same time. And I try to keep a straight face and say it's okay, but I'm always interested who out there is telling people that there's something bad about using a pen and paper. If that works for you, and there's a lot of studies about the, um, uh, the use of the muscles, that kin kin kinetic or kinesthetic knowledge that we have when we're writing things down is really important for um, you know, retention and so on. Um, it works really good for a lot of people. So you don't have to discard it, okay? And if you've never taken notes with pen and paper, try sometime. Won't hurt, won't hurt. So what's the key difference? What's the key difference? Well, one key difference is What's different about me being online with you, where you hear my voice and being in a room with you? And it's something that um, a long ago a philosopher and scientist called tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge comes from a book called Personal Knowledge, published still by the University of Chicago Press by a man named Michael, and I always mispronounce his name, Polyani. And he coined the phrase, things that we know in face-to-face -face interaction for which there are no words. 
And uh, you know, talking, for example, in art, there's things that you learn that you don't even know you're learning, watching somebody paint or watching someone play the piano, or when my friend Gail comes over, who's a master gardener, and just watching how she uses um, her tools to plant and prune, right? I mean, she just did a beautiful pruning job for our, our property, and just watching how she held the tools told me something that I want to copy, even though I don't understand necessarily intellectually why it's important. The look on the face, tone of the voice. Yes, if, if I had a video here, I would have a lot of information. I make a choice not to use videos most of the time because they just eat up bandwidth. And I want you really to pay attention to the words more than anything. But there is a level of tacit knowledge we learn when uh, we miss out on when we're not in a room face to face. So that's one issue that's different between old school and new school. Um, another thing is that all the stuff we have to do virtually, right? We do daily backups. I probably back up what I'm working on three or four times a day. Plus we do external drive backups. We're always testing new software, testing every time something upgrades, meltdowns like today, mistakes we make, mistakes other people make. There is more overhead, more time taken to get tech working than it is just walking into a classroom for both the teacher and the student. It's just a fact. It's just a fact. And so when you try to do shortcuts, um, it's more likely technology is going to fail and that you're not going to have a good experience with folks. So we have to change our expectations about productivity. We have to change the idea of how, how much we can produce. And this really hits both students and faculty when we're doing classes because we can feel like we're failing somehow, that we're not working hard enough. I mean, most of us are very conscientious. What's wrong with us? Well, it's different what we have to do. It's different what we need to do to keep things running. So if we have to add for myself, because I do this so often, it's an extra hour or two a day to keep the technology running uh, as compared to how my life was as a trainer like 20 years ago. And that means that I have to be realistic about my priorities and what I can produce in the time given. And I think that's something that has to be a conversation with administrators, with students, with faculty, with everybody about what our expectations are as well. Um, there is a lot of writing that goes along with being online. And yes, there's a lot of, of different programs that have breakout rooms and people can talk and so on. But if we put aside social media, in the formal courses that I've taught, you know, six week, eight week courses online that had an independent component, and then people had to write assignments and so on, like the one that I just finished for the State Library, it's a lot of writing. It's a lot of writing. And I think that we went through this weird phase, I say weird to be polite, uh, this phase in education before the pandemic where too many people were getting used to walking into a room, watching a PowerPoint or watching a video and walking out of the room. And for someone like myself, who's very old school, I walk into a room, I've got a flip chart, the lights are on, I give people assignments, they have to talk, they have to write, they do things, and people are surprised. You know, well, I just thought I'd be able to nap in the back row. <laughs> so there is an expectation of writing, and it is not the same as social media. And I find that people's writing skills are truncated because, um, they are used to writing in 240 characters uh, in a little burst. And what's necessary in a lot of online classrooms is development of ideas, development of ideas. And I have to say that the group that we had in June doing this long course were splendid in terms of their writing. And I also will tell you when I was a college instructor, the difference between getting a B and an A in my class was how well that you wrote. And that was important to me. So all the kind of things you do that you might have been used to in a face-to-face -face with classroom discussions and you raise your hand, right, and give the right answer, all that kind of stuff and nodding and smiling now is done in writing. 
and even with Zoom classes, um, hopefully there is a writing component where we sort of reflect on the material as well. So that's something to be thinking about both as an instructor and a student on things. Uh, another thing is that because of the pandemic, but even before that, people who were studying at home often felt isolated. They felt isolated from people. It's different taking an online course for particularly well, both in high school and college as opposed to being in a room with other people. And I watched the last two years as one of my best friend's husbands, and I'm going to use the word, the S word, suffered through what was supposed to be a very high level master's degree program in computer security. He works for the Air Force, and if he told you what he did, he'd have to kill you, I guess. <laughs> this is how it operates. Sweet man, you know, wicked smart. And he felt so isolated because the only person he was communicating with was the instructor for each of the classes. He didn't have any interaction with the other people, which I thought was like really bad way to run a class. The class was in Vermont. He lived in Kansas. Um, and and um, the nature of the class was that nobody at his workplace really knew much about what he was doing except his boss about things. And I find that that's part of the problem. Um, so this is where I tell people that it's a good idea to buddy up. It's a good idea to find particularly both student and faculty, uh, find people who know what you're doing, who understand, folks you can find on Facebook, on, on, on different platforms that you can do. Maybe you're lucky because you're in the kind of program where it's agreed upon that students will have access to each other and talk to each other and so on, that they can kind of buddy up, as it were, to communicate. And um, even your crazy neighbor might be someone who has the technical skills that you need. I remember we had these wonderful crazy neighbors down the block and they were so much fun. They were silly and fun and they had dogs and parrots and cats and, and they were just sweet and charming and funny, funny, funny. And one day I was over there because we were having a big talk about our pets and I looked over at their work table and I realized they had state-of-the-art computers. And I said, oh, what do you folks do? And it turned out both the husband and the wife were very high level administrators of important high tech programs. She practically ran the computers for an HMO and they knew a lot about computers and such. And I thought, wow, what an incredible resource. And they had kids and they were friendly. But if you just knew them casually, you just think, oh, they're the fun loving, you know, Tammy and her fun loving husband and the crazy kids down the block. Not that they had the skills that you might need. And this is where I think community comes in, that we don't want to isolate ourselves from the human beings around us and think that we're in some sort of intellectual prison having to teach and or learn without other human beings that we can talk to once in a while. So however you can do it that makes you feel safe and the other people feel safe, finding ways that you can keep communicating with people I think is really, really important. Now, if you want help with your writing, um, if you think that's gonna help you as an instructor or a student or both, pretty much the acknowledged best program in the country and it's free it's free ladies and gentlemen is in purdue university in indiana the purdue online writing lab owl and owl.purdue.edu boy they are terrific i should be rich for all the times i recommend them but all the people i know who write for a living recommend them and it's a great way there's other writing tools out there of course but it's a great way not just to have some program that improves your writing so you don't have to learn how to write but really gives you a lot of information and ideas and i hope whoever you are that you take the time to check them out they're pretty awesome so what are the things that we should be aware of so what are the things that we have to be a little careful of when we're talking about online classroom success um, the biggest one starting out i prioritize these is procrastination and in that class that we just taught, my partner in doing it, a woman named, wonderful woman named Christine with our Colorado State Library, we gently, good humoredly nagged 
all of the participants two weeks before we started about it's so easy to run out of time. It's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy. So even though a lot of the programs are asynchronous, meaning that you don't have to meet at the same time to get the information, we still do that old 80-20 rule that a lot of us know that typically 80% of the work of a project is done in the last 20% of the time given. That's not a good thing. <laughs> it's not a good thing. So we had weekly check-ins and I emailed people. In some cases, I called people privately. How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? And all the people I know who teach professionally online, who are uh, teaching, um, you know, who are college instructors or professors teaching online, they say that's probably the hardest thing is to get people to realize that it's a big problem if you try to um, wait at the last minute. In fact, if you have access to the information before hand, which I think is a good thing, try to get ahead a little bit, even though that might not be your style. Don't try to say, okay, I'll have lots of time. Start today. And I find it's really good to put aside certain times. Like I like to do, there's a lot of things I like to do on Sunday mornings because it's peaceful. I get a lot of work done on Sunday mornings. And maybe there's a time for you that's a good time to do it. But don't wait until you think you have enough time and do keep up. So procrastination is maybe the number one um, sin of people who teach and study online. Um, the second thing is technology. And people who work with me inevitably know that this is one of my mantras. All technology sucks, including every single established learning platform. We're still in the infancy on these programs in my opinion. And I've seen some things improve a lot in the last 25 years, but some stuff not. And it kind of irks me when I have a client who works, uses one of the um, learning management platforms out there because they're with a uh, K through 12 or they're with a college that has a lot of bells and whistles they have to do, how complicated a lot of things are and how much learning it takes. You know, they tell you you're going to learn stuff and you're like, whoa, I tell people, find out as quickly as possible what platforms are out there and study them and uh, practice on them before your course starts, which will give you a heads up on everybody else. And remember, if things fail technology, it is never your fault unless you actually took your computer and threw it in the lake <laughs> or got up to the top of your house and threw it the two stories down on the sidewalk. Unless you've done those two things, it's really not your fault when technology fails. Now, multitasking, oh, um, yeah, I multitask some days. I, I'll admit it's like being an AA. Yes, I'm Pat Wagner and I multitask for sure. But there are too many studies and just, just go online yourself and just type in multitasking studies that first of all, switching from task to task seems to take longer than we think. We think, in other words, we're being productive, but we're not as productive as we think we are. We make more mistakes on stuff, and I can, I can say that for myself. Um, I recently did a project for a client, and I was trying to multitask on it, and she sent it back to me, and it was riddled with stupid typos. And I was like, you know, I know why this happened. And we gave plenty of time for stuff, and I told her, she said, oh, yeah, I do that too. Uh, things get uncompleted. You know, there, there's gaps in what we're trying to produce. Uh, you're taking a test online and you haven't even realized that you missed four of the questions or you told yourself, oh, I'll get back to that particular module and you never do. And it's just sort of hanging out there. Uh, so what we want to do is to beware the fact that um, in a panic we'll multitask. And for most people, nothing applies to everybody. Focusing and saying, I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour on this one thing is really important. Now, if you're working at home and you have pets and children, uh, in our family, we used to say, that's why God made bathrooms, because it's often the only room in the house that has a lock on the door 
or go out to the car and sit there and do something else. But you have to really work with your family and the people you live with so them to understand this is serious and I need somebody to help. That's why you, you might even need a neighbor or a good friend to babysit for you. Oh, what a concept while you're trying to do something important as well. Another part of it, and this is aimed at um, any administrators <laughs> who might be listening to this program, the issue of expediency, that uh, somehow we're going to be able to cheat and cut corners by using digital stuff that somehow it's not going to take as long. Uh, oh, we don't have all the travel, but there's still a lot of work. And I like to tell people that the idea that something is quick and cheap is a myth. There's a cost and often is the quality of what we do and the credibility that we have with the our other stakeholders, you know, the credibility an instructor has with their students and vice versa. I hear students tell me that they had a good experience online. But you know, even before the pandemic, that's not what people told me. I, the um, phrase I heard the most from people was that they felt cheated. Uh, and I think part of it was that the instructor and the administrators fell into the trap of not realizing what the overhead was and what they would have to do differently. And that whole thing about effective and efficient, um, effective is about quality. Efficient is about speed. And those are two different creatures. Those are two different creatures. And as we've said before, dealing with uh, any kind of machines or tools and stuff, that's a different set of problems than my battery died on the way to the um, building where I'm supposed to be teaching or learning. So they, they're everyday things that happen to all of us. You know, they're everyday things that um, can affect how well we learn and how well we teach. And I know all of you know them, but I just want to tell you that they're important. They're important in the quality of the experience and, and how we, we help each other grow and learn as well. So what's this thing about a home classroom? And I want to share my experience, not just working with online learners, but all the experience we had having to set up uh, two rooms pretty much in our house are completely devoted to all the work that we do online and some of the things that I've learned that, that have helped me along the way as well. Um, so one thing is getting smarter about education as a whole. And this is information that's not secret information. And I think a good analogy is that even more than before, every one of us should know a lot about our own health, on home care, practical medicine, and so on. You know, I'm, I'm so pleased that I grew up in an era where um, young people my age had to learn advanced first aid. I love the fact that, that we have a, a really nice first aid kit, that we have all sorts of, you know, bandages and antiseptic stuff and, and things like that, that we have all sorts of things. We, ha we have home test kits for stuff. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that we have, not with the permission of our doctors, with the encouragement of our doctors. You know, I remember a few years ago, um, I had pneumonia and I recovered and I went to see my regular doctor who had also recovered from pneumonia in recent months. And I told him that some of the things that weren't really good that happened at the hospital. And he said, oh, Pat, you always have to be in charge of your own health. You have to be your own advocate and make sure your family advocates for you. Can't just sort of put your, your life in the hands of the medical establishment, partly because a lot of good people are really busy and it's easy for things to fall between the cracks. Well, you know what? I feel the same way about education. So I want to share with you a URL. It's at, and I just tested it yesterday, so it should work, instructionaldesign.org slash theories backslash back slash theories backslash. And what it is, it's a list of 50 educational theories. Now, it sounds a little overwhelming, but if you're a student, and I'm including anybody of middle school age or older, um, or you're an instructor, 
sort of learning what's out there might enlighten you to ways to learn and teach better. And the sites that are there, um, you don't need a college degree to understand. A lot of stuff is common sense. It's kind of interesting. There's some repetition, but this has been my go-to site for years to tell people there's dozens of different theories about how people teach and learn. There's not one theory and there's probably more than this. So the more you learn, the more you can say, oh, I have a better idea how to teach. I have a better idea how to learn now. Um, another part of it, and this was something about attitude that I really learned as a college instructor. When people would come to me, and, and I taught for seven years at a, a school that was called at the time Metropolitan State College of Denver, 30,000 undergraduates, and it was a school that catered to what we called at the time non-traditional students, people over 25 with families and jobs, most of whom did not come from families who went to college before. Excellent school, very good reputation. It's now a university, it's pretty cool. And I would meet with my students and I would ask them, and it was all voluntary, um, did they have a job outside of the home? If they were in the home, what was their responsibilities? Um, what were their goals for their college education and how much credit they would take? And I would have people who had a full-time job and a family to take care of and were taking 18 credits. And my professional response to this was, what are you, nuts or something? <laughs> and we would talk about money and time and everything. And I spent a lot of time talking people out of their course loads, but also talked about things like, what kind of volunteer work are you involved in? What kind of commitments and promises have you made to your social clubs and all sorts of things you're about? Um, what do you feel about dusting? Maybe this is a time to give up cleaning your house for a few days. So what we tell people that if you are taking courses in a way that means that you're getting graded, you've paid a lot of money, you want to take it seriously, you have to think about this is my new job. What are you going to have to give up to have the time to do it well? And that goes back also to the problem of there's more overhead to doing classes online. And so where are you going to find the room? There's this unpleasant thing called the time-space continuum, and it's really hard to leverage more hours than you have in a day. So you'll have to talk, maybe renegotiate with your family about what the family priorities are while you're in school. I remember there was a point in time where I was in college, my mother was in college, and my sister was in graduate school. And if my sister and I were visiting, the entire dining room table was completely filled with my books, my sister's books, and my mom's books, and we would study together. And my mother, who used to be really fussy about sit-down meals, she would be the one, and, and folks were talking like years ago, she would be the one who would say, okay, what kind of takeout do you want? And she, one day she called me up while I was living here in, in uh, Denver. She lived in Wisconsin. She called me up and she said, I'm so proud. She said, I have stopped dusting and I have stopped making my bed and I have so much more time to study because she was a perfectionist. I said, good for you, Ma. So what will you have to give up? You have to change your expectations of what you can do with the time that you've been given. So what we'd like to do is a couple of things, right? You want to establish the home base. Where's the place? Um, and it might be a corner of a bedroom, might be a dining room, might be a place. Uh, if you live in a warm weather climate, if you're watching us on Facebook, maybe it's a place you can do it outside where you want to establish your home base. And home base might be as simple as having a file cabinet and a comfy chair and a place that you can work. So you have storage for office supplies and you have had, as we've said before, the talk with your cohabitants about what the rules are. And of course, there's always going to be things that will make things difficult and interruptions. I'm not saying there isn't. I mean, I work out of the house and my office is right next to the front door in terms of, you know, packages being delivered and neighbors coming by and all the things that can happen when you're home. But nonetheless, you cut down a lot of noise if you're willing to talk about these things. And it might be that you have a busy sign up. You might have a regular schedule of some kind. I know uh, among my writing friends, there's a famous story about a writer in New Mexico who had a sign on his driveway and he actually had a, gay, um, a uh, chain, 
across his driveway so you couldn't get up the hill to his house and he had a big sign and the sign said unless you have spotted jesus on the old taos road don't come don't come in right and people laughed about the sign but it really is about triage right <laughs> If the person still has a pulse, they're breathing on their own and they're not bleeding from a major artery, let me finish this class assignment. And physical calendars, you know, the old fashioned put a print calendar or, or a board up on a wall. We, we have them in our house and, and I print out stuff for my computer if I'm gonna have a busy month. I print up stuff and we have a place to post it in the kitchen. So my husband who's 10 yards away will remember what I'm doing that day uh, and what I need to do to get things done. So again, it's a little more, even though we're smart cookies, we need to do a little more to communicate well. So old school, if we're talking about setting it up right to be able to seriously perhaps pursue a degree, and fortunately, a lot of this stuff can be gotten not only cheap, but you can share it with neighbors and friends. Um, this is how we do it, old school. We have a copier and we have a fax machine. In fact, we have two copiers. We have a landline and part of that is because we want the quality of what we do for you folks to be high. We actually have three landlines and we have extra chargers for every major piece of equipment we have for our laptops, cell phones and so on because guess what they die. We also have a cork board um, and I think the best management tool invented in the last few centuries have been index cards. I love office supplies, I love colored index cards, and paper and file folders. Now that was what we needed to do in the old school, in the old school before digital. Um, we also have to be able to anticipate things are gonna mess up. So for example, before I do my programs for Do Space, I send them a PDF of everything I've done. And the reason for that is to ensure that the pretty type that we have on um, this program is available to people because we forget that if you don't have the typeface on your computer, um, guess what? It might not translate if I send you my PowerPoint. So everything we do, we always make our clients a backup copy as a PDF and they have it before the program in case for some reason something fails on my computer that we have to do it differently. Um, I kill trees. Um, I download screenshots. So if something is going on online that's really important to me, if I, um, if I can't do it any other way, particularly if I can't do a print to a PDF to my computer, um, I, I download, download a screenshot uh, and put it in a file. So perhaps you're, let's pretend you're working on a formula of some kind and something is goofy about the platform. So you're working live on the platform and it won't let you work offline and then, you know, off, off the platform and then on again. Uh, you know, we have the screenshots and we might even make hard copies of what's there for the time that everything crashes. And since, yes, all technology sucks, we wanna make sure. Whatever we do, we record what we can when we can. Some people record to the cloud, which is fine. We just wanna remind people the cloud isn't on another planet run by supernatural beings. It's simply somebody else's computer, someone else's server somewhere in the world. And yes, I've had, um, Dropbox fail, I've had Google Docs, the old Google Docs fail, I've had the Apple Cloud, iCloud fail. Um, so I like to have multiple ways that I could record. And I have friends who do a lot of serious uh, graphic and video work online and they have an extra external drive plugged in, always making uh, in real time a backup of everything we're doing. And yes, backup on other devices. I use uh, time, we use Time Machine a lot uh, because we're in the Apple world, but we also have devices and we spend some time and money investing in good backup things. And yes, we back up multiple times every day. Um, the whole thing about software, and this becomes an issue for all of us. The platforms that are used for online learning uh, update and the people who update them think it's funny not to 
to tell us. <laughs> All right, I'm being mean now. Maybe, maybe it's just they don't know either. But I have been on a major learning platform and tested it on a Monday. It worked perfectly. On Tuesday, ran a national program with a national association out of Chicago. Everything worked perfectly. We went into the second session on Friday. In between Tuesday and Friday, the company changed key features, didn't tell anybody, and it failed. And we had the backups, fortunately. We were able to get through because the client in Chicago had the PDFs, and we were able to run what were the equivalent of slides. And I called in on a hard line, and we were able to get things done. But keeping up with the updates is important, and it's time consuming, and sometimes it's expensive. And the problem is the long, and I speak from personal experience, the longer you wait to update, the more likely that the features you need in the future will not be available to you. And this to me is part of the digital divide that a lot of people do have computers. Um, however, they don't necessarily have the time and resources to keep them updated. And then when they go to take a class or do something, they're not able to do it. I think we have to spend more time investing in uh, the time and energy investing in our students in particular to see if they have what they need available to them and how we can help them get it if they don't. I think that's important. Meanwhile, important deadlines, <laughs> right? Where you have an important paper due or you have an important class to teach, you want to make sure that you're checking your systems at all time so you don't have those ugly surprises. Um, the audio. Now, I'm speaking to you from a uh, landline. Uh, we use Comcast here in Denver, and we're, we're very satisfied with it. And we have a, um, a, a business level bandwidth, which is good. Uh, and sometimes people say, gee, Pat, I can hear you so clearly. Well, a long time ago, I have a friend in the radio business named Kathy Bradshaw. I mention her because she's one of my icons in the world and was a radio goddess here in Denver, award-winning news reporter and talk show host. And now she's a, a um, college professor in Ohio. And when we first started doing this work very seriously a few years ago, I said, Kathy, what's the most important thing we can do? And she said, Pat, you want to get the best quality headphone you can. And the best quality are those great gaming headphones, the headsets that have the earphones and the, ma um, and the mic on them you know, everything attached. And I was able to get one online at the time for 70% off the retail price. There's bargains online. And it's great for me for two reasons. I feel that it gives my um, people who are listening a really good quality. But the other thing is that I have hearing loss. And um, I can hear much better what's going on with these closed earmuffs and um, the gaming mic tells me that I'm going to be heard well. So if you're having to spend a lot of time online, this might be something to consider, particularly if you're like me and have a little hearing loss. Well, for me, it's a lot. Um, helps me participate without feeling that I'm holding other people back, which is nice. So yes, the here's a little bit more about backups in the cloud and, and how often we like to back up. I kind of repeat myself on this, but I think it's really important. Nothing is more important when you realize that you just lost your semester's work. Please, please, please back up frequently about stuff. Um, this is an obvious thing. You write on your own computer offline. You edit the stuff offline and you back it off online before you post. And what I was saying before is not all platforms will let you do that in terms of a cut and paste. Nonetheless, if you write your responses on your computer and have them there, then when you put them online where you, you aren't allowed to just transfer, you have to type in, you still have the original. I will complain to you that a lot of my clients who hire me for training programs have fancy application things for our proposals and you can't cut and paste on those these things you have to type it, the stuff in fresh every time so and they warn you about that so i write everything out i have my copy and it has saved me more than once ladies and gentlemen the fact that i had that hard copy available for it so again it's a little bit of the overhead of doing this for well um yeah 
So, yes, Pat, but I've been typing in things for 15 years and I've never lost anything. Okay, okay. Um, just let me know if you have denounced me in this class and in the next two years say, let me know if you've lost something significant. Be honest, right? Just, just be honest and email me and let me know. And I won't say I told you so. I'll just say they're there. So what are some better practices to help us improve as we're talking about um, online education, things that we think work pretty well? Um, participate. So again, let's assume that you are there for a grade, that it isn't just for uh, personal development, that you really, you're a student and you're trying to improve your grade. Your active participation might be the thing that decides your grade. And that was the problem that I've had with a couple of classes. I, I did a series of courses for the Medical Library Association. People weren't getting a grade, but they were getting a, an important certification by going through the programs that we were giving. And this is where we said over and over again, active participation is going to be 50% of the points you get towards your certification. And we were very clear what we meant in terms of participation. Um, and we still had a couple people who didn't know what they were supposed to do. But a lot of people said, you know, I was glad to know what the parameters were so I could fill it. Active participation might mean for some instructors uh, commenting on other people's posted work, commenting yourself, not on one hand what I call grunting, you know, writing, like pretending that you're writing for the old Twitter and 140 characters and you're done. On the other hand, you don't want to write, uh, publish your 10,000 word novella. I actually had a couple of students that I had to say, put the 10,000 word novella that you're writing into a separate document, a Word document and attach that. But in your day-to-day -day posts for people, uh, two or three paragraphs are just going to be very fine. Um, to post online as required, <clears throat> and remember, keep to those deadlines. Keep to those deadlines because you'll fall behind. And by the way, it's a way of reinforcing what happens with everybody. You know, it, it's like the rising water lifts all boats. Having a bunch of people actively participating improves the experience for everybody online as well. Uh, as we were saying before, <clears throat> having someone to partner with is really important. Um, if you have to talk to your dog, talk to your dog. But if you can tell somebody <clears throat> what you're learning online, like tell someone, report to someone. And even though my husband and I aren't formal students these days, it's amazing how much we, time we spend reporting to you, reporting to each other. So here we are, even though we communicate with a lot of people, he and I are the only people we might see every day. And so several times a day, he comes into my office or I go into his office and said, oh, guess what I just found out about it. And yes, those, those amazing studies, that if you learn something and you tell someone else what you're learning, you retain the learning better. If you can teach it to someone else, you learn it even better. So you can tell someone something you're learning online, you can teach somebody else what you're learning online, and then finding people you can check in with check in with other people either online or offline and kind of report what you're learning. It'll actually help you be a better learner. Active learners tend to retain and it's that danger we have about click, click, click through. When I was uh, doing a project for the University of North Texas, we had a wonderful platform uh, that on the old Blackboard platform called LEAD. Um, uh, learning at your desktop and it, it was a big success and people around the country would take it in their workplaces to get um, workplace credit and credit that went toward um, you know promotions and so on and uh, I'll never forget this a library director in Ohio called my boss and he said uh, she said to him we have a, one of our employees who is very excited about your programs and he took or she took 32 courses. Now, these are usually six-week courses and took 32 courses and wants credit for it. Is that reasonable? And my boss said, let me take a look because Black 
dashboard keeps track of when you log in, when you log out, and how much time you spend. And guess what we found out? This person was basically going click, 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 going as fast as they could from one end to the other of these courses, uh, participating very minimally in anything that was required, just enough to get to the next page, and basically had done everything in like 10 days. So we reported back to the boss and said, nah, we don't think so. And I'm sure they had an interesting conversation. Participation means building relationships with people online, not just clicking through. Um, and as we said before, it raises, it raises the boats for everyone. Everyone feels engaged. I have a goal, by the way, for a number of classes that I teach that have a very active component. I want 50% of the material created for the class created in the posts that people share with each other on the platform. And if people don't have money to get a fancier platform, I just say use a, a um, private LinkedIn group. LinkedIn has a good reputation of not being hacked very much as compared to Facebook or Twitter or some of the other platforms. It's free pretty easy to use, you know, it's not weird, it's used to accommodating lots of different people. And it's a way that people can asynchronously read what other people have written down and post and so on. But my goal is that amount of posting and comment and oh, what did you mean by this, all that kind of discussion should equal more than 50% of the content of what people are doing. That's, that's my goal. That's my goal about stuff. Remember, um, easy to fall behind. And again, um, just like backing things up, keeping up is one of the key problems you're going to run into on online education as well. Um, if you're a student, I'll tell you a secret. Uh, a lot of the people who are teaching you, they're new to online learning. There's a wonderful man who lives down the block from me who's an award-winning English professor at the University of Denver, and he's written all sorts of books in his area. Uh, he's probably in his 60s, and he's never taught online before March. Um, and fortunately, he has a great reputation, great teacher, but he says, I'm struggling. So let's, again, pretend we're all in this together and we're all trying to help each other together. Um, you want to confirm people actually receive the documents. And this was something I had to teach my computer security friend in Kansas about his interactions in, uh, with his instructors in the school in Vermont. I said, yeah, you've been using all the stuff and it's been one way. You've just been saying, okay, here's the document, here's the thing, confirm, which means sometimes you have to nag the instructor and confirm they actually receive the documents and the communications. It's really hard at the end of the semester if they haven't been getting things. I just had a situation like that where it turned out one of the people I'd been sending documents to um, that their computer had been putting everything in spam for a month. And we finally figured out they were very apologetic, but they were doing kind of the finger pointing at me, which annoyed me. <laughs> but we figured it out. We figured it out. So confirmation is important through multiple sources as well. Again, in summary, if you need a way to edit things when you're alone, before you send it to an instructor, edit it out loud, read it out loud is a simple technique. If you're alone at home trying to do a class, either as an instructor or a student, and edit it backwards, which means start at the back of the document, whatever it is, and edit paragraph by paragraph, because my experience is that's where most of the mistakes are gonna be made. So think about what your first steps are going to be. Like if you had a tech plan um, for making sure your technology works for your online classes, what's your backup? What is it that you might have to stop doing so your schedule is more honest? So I hope this has been helpful. I'm going to turn it back to Omaha. Are you there, Omaha? And let's see if we have any questions or comments that have come in. Um, we did have a question on whether we could uh, give out the slides or not. Um, and the best way to do that is to email programs at dospace.org and I will send you a copy of the slides. And I will actually just put that, my chat box disappeared. There's my chat box. 
I will put that in chat so that if you need them. Very good. So if you need the slides for today's presentation, um, please send us an email there and I will get them forwarded to you. Um, I don't think we had any other questions. Does anybody have any questions for Pat? Well, um, if anybody is interested in rewatching this, um, it will be on YouTube later in the month. Um, and Pat, thank you for stopping by and giving this presentation and we will see you next time. Very good, thank you. Always a pleasure. All right, you guys have a good day.